Today's reading is from John chapter 15, verses 18 through 27 in the English Standard Version. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, then they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all of these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. This is the word of God. I want to start today with a reminder of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first large-scale public sermon, that he opened with these, these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus redefined what blessing is, that it's a blessing to be humble, to be lowly, to be low in the world in order to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And he ends it with this word about persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You get this framing of the Beatitudes, two groups to whom the kingdom of heaven belongs, those who are humble and poor in spirit, and those who are persecuted, who suffer in the name of Jesus. And he goes on, he expands on that persecution thing and says, blessed are you. When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, hear this command, brothers and sisters, rejoice and be glad. When you're persecuted, when people are falsely saying all kinds of evil against you, the command in Scripture is to rejoice and be glad. Why? For your reward is great in heaven. There's one reason. There's a reward for it, and you are now in the company of the prophets. That's how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And of course, Jesus is looking ahead to say, guess how they're going to treat me? Don't expect any different results. And then you, if you're with me in John chapter 15, he turns from this beautiful poetic analogy of a vine and branches. You abide in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. And he commands love. He says, I've given you this, this one command if you would just love each other because I'm going to the Father. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, but you guys love each other. Take care of each other. You're going to need each other. And then he explains why that command is so vital that we continue to obey Abiding in him and loving one another, he says, be prepared for the response. If the world hates you, know that it, it hated me before it hated you. He gives the disciples near the end of John 15 a little pep talk about perseverance. We'll see three, three keys to having an enduring faith because Jesus knew that for the disciples it was about to become very difficult. They were all going to scatter in just an hour or so from the Garden of Gethsemane where they're praying. They're going to fall asleep, and then they're going to run. And they're going to huddle together in fear for their lives, seeing how Jesus was captured, put on trial, and executed, and expecting the same result for each of them. They would be fearing for their lives. And going on, of course, we know 10 of the 11 apostles would eventually be killed for their faith, and John would die in exile. So he's preparing them not only for their immediate future, but for the next 10, 20, 30 years they needed to endure. So if you're in a time right now where you're struggling to keep going, where you're trying to hold on 
from one day to the next. These words are for you. Here's how we can persevere through great tribulation. The first key to persevere, to have an enduring faith, is to prepare to be hated. How can we face opposition and struggle and suffering and persecution? The first key to enduring that is to expect it. We should not be surprised when we begin to lose our freedoms. We should not be surprised when the government comes along to confiscate our property. When it becomes a hate crime to quote the Bible. These things are coming for us and potentially not in the too distant future. We should be prepared to be hated by this world because it's not our home. Here's what Jesus says. If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. There's this dichotomy between this world, this present darkness, this present evil age called the world, and the kingdom. Jesus came to announce the kingdom. He came to inaugurate the kingdom of which he is the king. And his resurrection was his inauguration and rising to the throne of glory in in public recognition that he is the king of his kingdom, but it is a kingdom in opposition to this world. And that's how it has always been for Israel. You ever wonder why, why did God put Israel in Israel of all the places, right? Anyone who's ever played Risk knows you take Australia. Maybe, maybe South America, if somebody already got to Australia. You take the easily defendable place. No one, if you've ever played Risk, no one attempts to keep Asia. It is is the absolute guaranteed way to fail at the game of Risk. You cannot hold Asia, or or Europe for that matter, and Africa is difficult too. Where did God put Israel? Right Right in the very middle. For exactly that reason... Because he wanted his people from the very beginning, from the days that Abraham was wandering in this land, they had to trust him for their very survival. I'm I'm reading right now a book called Six Days of War, the 1967 Six Day War of when Israel was literally, I did not know the details until reading this book, when Israel was literally surrounded, Egypt mobilized all the way up to the Sinai Peninsula, all the way up to the Negev, and they were their entire Egyptian army at the border of Israel in the south. The Syrians moving in from the north, the Lebanese farther north, the Jordanians in the west, in the east, I'm sorry, which way? Thank you. Yeah, the west is the water, right? Okay, you got it. All right. So, in the east, Jordan coming from, from the east, backed by Iraq and Iran, and the Soviet Union, 67, we're in the middle of the Vietnam War, so the United States, the United States gave nothing to Israel. I was blown away by that fact. Not a single bullet did the United States send to help Israel in 1967. They were so afraid of the Soviet Union. Here's Israel surrounded on all sides by, by countries that are committed to their extinction, And basically what LBJ said to him was, guys, you're on your own. Good luck. They were were using French equipment. Crazy, the details of this. That has been been the history of Israel from their very beginning was fighting for their survival. The conflict between God's people and this world is, read your Old Testament. That's what it is. That's what the story is. God's saying to Abraham, go, your your people are going to end up in this land but what, why is the capture of Lot, the nephew of Abraham, why is that in the Bible? Because from the very beginning, it's a dangerous place to live. There's warring tribes there that are going to capture you and take you away, and you have to trust God to protect you. They end up in Egypt where they're slaves, and God delivers them from the most powerful empire on earth. They go in and conquer seven nations more powerful than them, but they don't drive them out completely, and so these remaining nations around them continue to attack and invade and threaten and eventually conquer. Babylon, Assyria, coming in and taking then the people away into captivity. It's the story of Israel. And not only threats from outside, but threats from within. What was the experience of the prophets and the kings continually being attacked and rejected by their own people? And then Jesus comes as the ultimate prophet, as the ultimate king, and what do the people of Israel do? Reject him and call for his crucifixion. Here's the line. You, 
as, as those who belong to the kingdom of God, we can spiritualize this and we celebrate heaven when there's, like Megan said, there's no more tears or pain or sadness. We belong to that. That is our home. But for now, residents of the kingdom are at odds with the people of this world. The world will hate us because we don't belong to it and we cannot ascribe to the values of this world. And so Jesus showed us his pathway to victory in this world is through death to resurrection. And he said, if you want to follow me, here's my symbol. Take up your cross and come after me. And early on, the disciples must have been like, huh? You know, like they weren't wearing those around their necks. Like, what's a cross, Jesus? What is that about? Later, they would understand, oh, that's how he's going to die. They didn't know that. Take up your cross. If you want to save your life, you must lose it. There's a danger of gaining the whole world and in the process losing your soul. There's a broad road that everyone's going to follow and leads to destruction. You've got to go the other way in this narrow path that's called poverty of spirit, that's called love for other people, and the world is going to hate you and rejected you and reject because if if you were of the world, the world would love you. You'd belong to it. You'd share all their values and priorities, and you'd live exactly with them. But because you, you are not of this world, I chose you out of the world. Of course, the world is going to hate you. And so the, the symbol of our faith is a picture of execution, of death, of sacrifice, of suffering. Rome was the world of the first century. Jesus was born into this dark world controlled by Rome, the empire. And in the end, the Jewish people of God conspired with Rome to call for his crucifixion and execution. And Jesus died at the hands of the world with the people of God complicit in that, which is obviously a tragic betrayal of what they should have done in welcoming their Messiah. But Jesus was hated by the world. And and did you catch... in the name of peace. The high priest said, it's better that one one man die for the nation. Interesting he said that. It's better that one man die. This rabbi, he seems like a good guy, teaches about love, but it's better that one man die than that the whole nation perish. The justification was peace. If we get rebellious here, if we gather around this Messiah, Rome may come in and destroy us. And so it's better for peace. It's better for our longevity if one would die. And so Jesus on the cross gave up his life. But of course, that's not just a symbol of sacrifice and suffering and death. It is to us a symbol of life and resurrection and victory. Because did you notice the cross is empty? This is why it's a symbol for us, because it represents both sacrifice, death, and faith, and the victory of since Jesus rose from the dead, we, as we follow him and and embrace that pattern of Philippians 2, he made himself nothing, humbling himself to the point of death on a cross, and therefore God exalted him. How are we to be exalted in Christ? It is only as we humble ourselves through poverty of spirit, embracing a lifestyle of love and sacrifice and service as we die to ourselves, that's how we are exalted in Christ, both now and forever. The cross is our model and our pathway. So the question, as you, as you prepare to face opposition, as you, as you prepare to be rejected by the world, what is the cross that you are having to carry right now? Because all of us have one. Jesus said, this is what it's going to look like. You follow me. There's a cross you have to carry. You have to die every day to yourself, to your own desires, your own comforts. This is mainly to prepare his people to face what would come in the world, the pressures from the devil and from those who don't serve the Lord. But a lot of times our greatest struggles are those from within the church, within the family. A lot of times we can feel like the struggle of marriage is a cross we have to bear. The struggle of parenting and raising children, the struggle of work, getting up every day, going to work, grinding it out, the struggle of ministry, of trying to care for other people and make disciples, the struggle of just life. 
and these bodies that break down. What's the cross that you are called to bear right now? See this word here. Jesus says, I chose you. I chose you for this. Last week we saw that phrase. He says, I appointed you. Jesus has specific designs and plans for each of us, and part of that is that we would persevere through opposition, suffering, struggle, and pain. So the first key to an enduring faith is to prepare, to not be surprised when we face opposition, suffering, struggle, and eventually even death for our faith. Second key is to plan to become more like our master, and let's remember how he was treated. Remember the word I said to you, Jesus said, a servant is not greater than his master. That's a reference to John 13, two chapters before. He just washed his disciples' feet and said, do you get it? Do you understand? This wasn't just a lesson in hygiene, guys. It was a lesson in life and leadership and servanthood. Uh, I've shared that I'm helping with Micah's soccer team, playing. he's playing on, the, um, on his high school team as a, as a freshman, so I'm helping coach that team. And um, if, if you've ever been a part of an athletic endeavor in August and September in Florida, like inside stuff like volleyball is like, it's nothing, it's nothing compared to the outside stuff. When, when, this, when this gear comes home, you know, the socks, the shin guards, the cleats, um, the, the, and, and, and we're helping with a team of 22 guys, and so I help with the other coach, and uh, we take turns who gets to wash all of the uniforms, this great privilege. So soccer socks, you know, are long, right? They're, they're super long. And by the end of a game, they are completely soaked. I mean, there's not, there's not like a fiber of that sock that is dry. It is com- completely soaked and disgusting. And when the guys put their uniforms in the bag, they all very thoroughly open those socks, right? <laughs> very conscientiously. Of course they don't. So, you know, you just dump it all in the washing machine. But then when it comes out and it's like partly clean, you have to deal with the socks. And you have to completely open them. It's as close as I can get to foot washing. You're like giving us this experience of like you're, you're reaching into this sock, and you're pretty sure, like, it's alive. It's going to, like, grab you. You know, there's something in there because the smell has to come from something. Like, how is this so overpowering? That's washing feet. And, and like, in the first century, everyone would have, just like, just like soccer socks or hockey equipment or football pads, like, everyone would have that same visceral, like, oh, my goodness, somebody has to deal with that. With foot washing, that's, they, they all wore sandals. They all walked on dusty roads. They all understood That's a terrible job. Nobody wants that job. But that's what Jesus, right before he died, when he should have been exalted as king, right? When he should have been worshipped, when he should have been, like, everyone's response should have been, like, Mary's response to to pour out this this ointment on his feet and worship him and and, and acknowledge him as king. But instead, he he gets the job of of washing feet. And he says, a servant is not greater than, than his master. So when... When the work in front of you day to day, when the ministry God calls you to feels like washing feet, let's not be surprised that that's the calling. It's a carrying of the cross. It's a humbling of ourselves. We need to, as we prepare to face opposition and struggle, we need to make our primary plan for the rest of life as we follow Jesus is to become like him, to become like our master. And he's shown us what's that what that looks like. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. He throws in this one positive thing. There will be those who keep your word. There will be those who respond to the gospel. Among those who oppose it and try to kill us, there will be others. If they kept my word, Jesus says, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they don't, they don't know him who sent me. Everything Jesus did was in dependence on the Father. He modeled that for us. John 5, he said, the Son can do nothing on his own. I only do what I see my Father doing. He lived everything in complete submission to the Father's will in this Trinitarian love. This is why we've been memorizing John 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If we can just 
begin to understand the eternal, infinite, overflowing love of Father for Son, proceeding in the Holy Spirit, that's where we're called to live and abide and make our home and rest our thoughts and live throughout our days. The reason the world hates us and hated Jesus is that it doesn't know the Father. It didn't understand Moses. It didn't accept the teachings and the, the Word of God. If I had not come and spoken to them, they wouldn't have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Jesus talks about his ministry as an extension of the, the ministry of the prophets in the entire Old Testament, the Word of God, that Jesus came and he spoke this gospel of the kingdom, and at the same time, he did the works to support the words. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. Words and works in perfect harmony, proclamation of truth, demonstration of love, miraculous signs, healing and miracles, all to validate he is who he says he is. He is the king. He is the embodiment of God's love. And that's the story of the whole Bible. God spoke and he acted. Genesis 1 begins with speech. Let there be light. We have Genesis 1 to explain how creation happened and what it means. God not only delivered his people from Egypt, he explained, you are my people. He gave him his own personal name at that time. He not only built up the nation of Israel and sent them in to conquer the promised land and gave them judges and kings, he explained every step of the way. He worked miraculously to create the nation, to protect the nation, to build them up, even to discipline them. And at every step, different prophets came along to help explain what God was doing. Words and works, speech and action. It's the whole Bible. This is what the Bible is a documentation of the works and words of God. And Jesus came in fulfillment as the ultimate prophet, the ultimate revelation, the one who would perfectly embody both words and works. And this is why he says now they're responsible. They've heard the words, they've seen the works, and now they're responsible. Jesus became the dividing line of history. Before that, people could maybe fuss and say that they didn't know, they didn't have. But since Jesus, history is divided by his name, and everyone on earth is divided by how they respond to his works and his words. Now they are responsible. But now they've seen and hated both me and the Father. But he said this is because it had to fulfill what's written in their law, in the Jewish law, and, and law could cover the entire Old Testament. This is a reference to Psalm 69. They hated me without cause. This is your homework for the week. Read Psalm 69. When, when your rabbi gives you a reference, he's giving you an assignment. He's saying, you want to understand? I'm giving you a little. They hated me without cause. What he's saying in that is, go read Psalm 69. I'm going to give you a couple highlights. Psalm of David one of those times when he's in trouble, running for his life, crying out for, save me, O God. The waters have come up. I'm sinking deep. My eyes grow dim. The, those who hate me are more there. He's surrounded by enemies. Mighty are those who would destroy me. So here's a time in David's life, whether he's running from Saul or running from his own son or persecuted or wherever he is hiding in a cave. But he says this, it's for your sake. I've borne reproach. Dishonor covered my faith. Zeal for your house has consumed me. Does that ring a bell? Our rabbi gives us all these things. It's all interconnected. Zeal for your house, David says, has consumed me. The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Let their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents, for they persecute him whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of him whom you, those you have wounded. God will say, but he ends with hope. God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah. People will dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inhale it. Those who love his name shall dwell in it. To be persecuted without cause. To be hated unjustly. This is what Jesus experienced. And it escalated toward the end of his ministry. So we need to prepare to face opposition and plan in the process to become more like our master, who was treated so unjustly. In 2016, Pastor Andrew Brunson 
went with his wife Noreen to the consulate in Turkey where they had served for 23 years, planting churches in small villages, working with refugees um, in the predominantly Muslim country of Turkey, 23 years pastoring and church planting. And they went to the consulate thinking they were going to get their long-term visas finally after 23 years. Instead, they were suddenly arrested and thrown in jail. They held uh, Noreen for 13 days, but then let her go and kept Andrew. He knew not how long or what the charges were. For the first 50 days, they put him in solitary confinement. And he could hardly sleep from just the adrenaline and the, and the fear and the uncertainty. They, for two months, they didn't even charge him with anything. Separated from his wife, from all contact with anyone. And, you know, you go that time without being able to sleep. He said he was sleeping maybe three hours a night. He began to wonder if he was even losing his mind, his ability to comprehend what was going on. One of the greatest struggles for him, he's a pastor for 23 years, a missionary, frontline worker for the gospel. And he'd read at Naram Johnson, he'd, he'd read missionary biographies. He'd read about people who were imprisoned and were tortured for their faith. And he wasn't super surprised to be arrested, but he expected, having read these books, that in the midst of that time of trial, he would have a special experience of God's love and presence and a peace that passes understanding. He expected there would be uncertainty and discouragement and confusion, but he expected there would be a special presence of God in the midst of that, and he felt nothing, nothing at all. He felt complete silence from the Lord, a complete absence of any emotional connection with God. Even as he's in solitary confinement and feeling like, like he's losing his mind, his ability to process. After 50 days, they finally let him out of solitary, and he was able to have visits from his wife, who um, did the courageous thing to stay in Turkey, even though it was a great danger to her life. In the, in the end, they accused him of being a missionary for Mormonism, a representative of the CIA, fomenting rebellion in the whole country of Turkey, and an assassin whose mission was to chop the heads off of everyone in Turkey. I mean, it was the most absurd set of allegations that had obviously no proof or evidence, but that's what they were holding him for. And it was so, he, they made him such a villain in Turkey that whenever they moved him, it had to be in an armored escort with dozens of military surrounding him because they made him a public enemy and people would have killed him if they'd left him um, visible in, in the streets. So he's held in, in prison with three life sentences hanging over him for insurrection, a pastor for 23 years, and no sense, no feeling of God's presence with him at all. So now he's not only struggling with the situation, he's struggling with who God is. Can I believe in this God who has apparently abandoned me? It was his wife, Noreen, who as soon as she could, she would go for her weekly visits and only got 15 or 20 minutes through glass on the side. She was the one who came and said, we have to submit to this reality. We have to surrender to it. And she embraced, I love this line. This is what stuck with me. This comes from the Voice of the Martyrs radio podcast. You can listen to the episodes. After her 13 days in, in prison and then when she decided to stay in Turkey, she came to this point of saying, we have to submit to God's will. This is obviously God's will. For Andrew to remain in prison, we don't know how long, maybe for the rest of his life. And she used this phrase. She said, Noreen, in Christ, always submits. Noreen, in Christ, always surrenders to the Lord's will. And she went to Andrew, and when she would visit him, she would say, Andrew, in Christ, always submits. Outside of Christ, if we're not abiding in him, we're not walking with him, who knows what we'll do? But in Christ, Andrew submits. In Christ, Noreen submits. And Andrew, in that time, after about two months in, in prison, made a choice of the will 
that he said, I don't feel like this. I have no emotional connection here at all, but I choose every day, I choose to believe. He became suicidal and depressed in the despair of all and the emotional. And, and Noreen said to him, Andrew in Christ chooses life, chooses faith, chooses to keep going. And he would say those words aloud to himself as a daily exercise of his will. One more key to enduring faith. Prepare for opposition. Plan to become more like our master and proclaim the worthiness of Jesus as the Spirit enables you. The last two verses here are all about the Holy Spirit and testimony. When the Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about me. This is the Spirit's job is to exalt the Lord Jesus, to bring glory to to the Lord Jesus, and it's our job as well. You also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. He told his disciples over and over again, don't worry about what you're going to say. You'll be called before kings and governors. You'll be arrested. You'll be persecuted. You'll be beaten up. Some of you will be killed. This all happened. Read the book of Acts. Immediately, they're arrested. Immediately, very soon, James is killed. Stephen is executed. They're, they immediately faced opposition, but Jesus said, don't worry about the words that you'll say. In that time, the words will be given to you and you will testimony. The word there, bear witness, is martyreo, where we get the word martyr. In the first century, it just meant witness. It was just like you're called into a courtroom and you martyreo. You, you bear your testimony. You share what you saw, what you heard. And he said, you've been with me. You saw everything. You heard the words. You saw the works. Testify to what you saw. Now, most of us don't have the dramatic testimony of those disciples. But if you've been following Jesus and put your faith in him, you have a testimony. You've heard his words. You've seen his works in your life, and that's what you're called to testify about. And the Spirit will help us to do that. And it's part of our enduring faith is to proclaim the truth that we know, to hold on to that truth and encourage each other with it. As Andrew's incarceration dragged on, after about a year, President Trump got involved, 2016. Uh, Vice President Vance got involved, or not Vance, the other one, Pence. Yeah. <laughs> and they advocated, they used every resource that the government had to try to get Andrew out of prison. And they thought at one point, Andrew actually had a, had a dream and had a, had a, he believed that God said, you're going to be free. So when those appeals failed and when the door was closed and all these crazy accusations came against him, and again, the, the verdict was three life sentences, he plunged into his lowest emotional point of total despair of this, this may be the rest, this probably will be the rest of my life sitting in prison. In, in that time, their three kids were out of the country. They had, they had grown. One graduated from college. One got married. And they couldn't be there, couldn't be a part. Of, even Noreen couldn't be a part of those things. They're missing. And in his low point of depression and despair, he came to this, his, his heart wanted to shout in defiance of God, in anger at God, in expressing that, betrayal and disappointment and abandonment. And in that kind of like on his knees crying out, what came out of his mouth was, Jesus, I love you. Not what his flesh wanted to say, but it's what came out of his mouth. And a little while later, he, he started to write a song. And he, and he says in the fight, he's like, I'm not a songwriter. I'm not a musical guy. You can, you can listen to the song on YouTube, and he's not a musical guy. Um, no, he's fine. He's fine. His voice is fine. Um, but the Lord gave him this song, again, like at the lowest point of his emotional state, really thinking he's going to be in prison the rest of his life. But this is the line. You are worthy. Jesus, you are, you are worthy of my all. My tears and pain I lift up as an offering. 
Teach me to share in the fellowship of your suffering. Lamb of God, you are worthy of my all. What a gift that the Lord gave him in that emotional low point to help him proclaim the truth that Jesus is worthy. Even of spending the rest of his life in prison. And he and Noreen, Noreen went to Turkey to bring revival in the church to Turkey. And they believe, they still believe to this day, God is going to bring a great harvest to the country of Turkey. And at one point later in his, in his um, time in prison, when he had a little more objective perspective on it, he, he realized, I'm more good to Turkey in prison. Some of you remember praying for Pastor Andrew Brunson back in 2016, 2017. The world was praying, not only for him and for his wife and his kids, but praying for Turkey. So he said, God mobilized more prayer for this country that we love by having me. He's like, I'm worth more in prison than I am out. And submitting to that and believing that God is going to bring something greater through the prayers of many because Jesus is worthy, worthy of my all. This is my declaration, he said, in the darkest hour. Jesus, the faithful one who loves me, always good and true, you made me yours. You are worthy of my all. After a couple months, he requested and uh, Noreen brought him Richard Warmbrand's uh, several of his books. I, I mentioned Warmbrand a couple uh, weeks ago, persecuted. He's the founder of Voice of the Martyrs, a uh, Romanian pastor who spent 14 years in prison, off and on and beaten and tortured brutally. And so Andrew is, is learning from uh, Pastor Warmbrand who referenced Matthew 5. When you're treated unjustly, when they're saying all this evil stuff about you falsely, rejoice, and the King James was, be exceedingly glad. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And Wormbrand said he took it as a command, in the context of persecution, a command to dance. I'm not going to have you act it out for me, but think about it. (laughs) So, so in, for a time in his, in his incarceration, Wormbrand would discipline himself every day to spend a few minutes leaping and dancing and jumping around. The guards must have thought he had lost his mind. But he says, I am just obeying the command of Scripture that says, in this moment, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And so Pastor Andrew embraced that discipline. For the rest of his time in prison, he would spend five minutes every day jumping and he says, I'm no more a dancer than I am a singer. As a dis- and again, and he never, and it, what ended up being two years in prison, the emotional connection with God never came back. What he had enjoyed, his entire walk with the Lord, his entire time in ministry, a closeness with the Lord, a sense of God's presence was not there at all, his whole two years in prison. But he was able to cope with the Spirit lifting him up with a resolution of his will, with his wife visiting him and reminding him of the truth, and by proclaiming the worthiness of Jesus. Here's our summary for today. How can we persevere? First, we have to prepare. Expect opposition. Expect persecution. We have to make it our central plan and purpose in life to become more like Jesus, to join him and rejoice in the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. And in the midst of that, to proclaim the worthiness of Jesus. He is worthy. He is worthy of it all. Say that with me. He is worthy. Make it a prayer and a declaration. Say, Lord Jesus, you are worthy. He is worthy. He's worthy of whatever suffering you're going through right now. He's worthy of it. He's worthy of your pain, your brokenness, your crisis, your challenge. He's he's worthy of our lives. When it comes to that, he's worthy of it all. We need to remind each other. We need to remind ourselves. Let's close with this from Revelation 12. 
in the middle of this book of all the craziness that's happening in the end times, here's how they conquered. The believers described in the book of Revelation, here's how they conquered. Two things. They conquered the enemy, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Obviously, the blood of the Lamb is our security and protection that we know nothing can touch us in our soul and our eternal spirit. But we also overcome by the word of our testimony. When we proclaim, He is worthy. He is worthy of it all. Lord Jesus, we bow before you, acknowledging that you are worthy of all of our suffering, of all of our pain, that you've called us to follow after you, carrying our cross joyfully, embracing those times that we have to suffer, that we have to struggle, that we don't understand. But what we know is that you are worthy of all of it. And so we bow before you humbly, asking for your strength. Prepare us, Lord, to face whatever's coming our way. Our main desire is to become like you. You are the master. We are the servants. Teach us to joyfully wash feet, to humble ourselves, and to rejoice and be exceedingly glad even when we face struggle and opposition. We proclaim your worthiness. In Jesus' name, amen.